What's good? It's Wood. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you love music like I do. We are talking Grammys. We'll go through the nominees, pick winners, discuss past winners, explore the category and its history as we near the date of the Grammy Awards ceremony. Producer of the Year, non-classical, easily one of the coolest categories and one that actually stretches back to the mid-70s. Tom Bell was his first winner in 75 after producing the stylistics with songs like You Make Me Feel Brand New. Woo! And Tom Bell would have probably had one by then already if this category were around, say, like two years prior after he wrote and produced the spinners I'll Be Around and Could It Be I'm Falling In Love and the stylistics People Make The World Go Round and You Are Everything all within the same year, year and a half. Tom Bell was a, was a true pioneer and a staple of that Philadelphia R&B sound. Seriously, we could do a whole video on Tom Bell, but he was this category's first winner, beating out Stevie Wonder, who was right in the middle of that epic five classic album run, coming off of Inner Visions and fulfilling this first finale albums. So Stevie was nominated there, but didn't win. He would, however, win just two years later after dropping the legendary Songs in the Key of Life double album. But yeah, Stevie not winning that earlier one tells you what kind of a powerhouse Tom Bell was. Now the biggest winner in this category is Babyface, who's won this thing four times. However, the most nominations in this category go to Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, who have 11 freaking nominations. 11 for writing and producing for Janet Jackson, New Edition, Sounds of Blackness, Usher. You couldn't get through the 80s, the 90s, or the 2000s without running into a bunch of Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis music. 11 nominations. Quincy Jones, by the way, is second place, right behind the leaders in both wins and nominations, with three wins and seven nominations. And the crazy part about that is that Quincy was already an influential producer, musician, like 15 to 20 years before this was even a category. So he might have had several more nominations or wins if you would include his early and middle career achievements. He didn't even start working with Michael Jackson until almost 30 years into his legendary career. Think about that. Other big winners are David Foster, or Catherine McPhee's husband to some, with seven nominations, actually tied with Quincy Jones for second place in both nominations and wins. He wrote hit songs for people like Whitney Houston and Celine Dion, as well as the band Chicago. He even wrote Shaka Khan's Through the Fire. That's the one that Kanye West sampled for Through the Wire. And he wrote Earth, Wind & Fire's After the Love is Gone. Pharrell Williams is the only other one with three wins. You know, producer Danger Mouse has quietly racked up five nominations. He has one win. Dr. Dre has three nominations and one win. Get well, Dre. This has not been a good year for the musical genius. Rick Rubin has two wins. Rock pop producer Greg Kirsten was a recent back-to-back -back winner with songs like Adele's Hello and Sia's Chandelier. You go, Greg. Billie Eilish's brother and producer Phineas is the reigning champ, which brings us to today and the first nominee, Jack Antonoff. Now Antonoff also records under Bleachers. I mean, his artist name is Bleachers. He's not literally recording under the... But Jack Antonoff, in the past one and a half years, just produced six songs off of Taylor Swift's Folklore, seven if you count the song The Lakes on the Deluxe Edition, he did not, however, produce the biggest single, Cardigan, but he also produced the return album from the Dixie Chicks, now called The Chicks. The album is Gaslighter. Jack produced that. He also produced Sia's new single, Together. Now, the prior year, Antonoff produced Taylor Swift's Lover, her Grammy-nominated seventh album, and her first album after her split from the Big Machine record label. Remember that whole nasty feud with her, Scott Borchetta, uh, Scooter Braun? Now, Antonov didn't produce the two biggest singles from that album, Me and You Need to Calm Down, but he produced most of the album. He produced Lana Del Rey's Norman Fucking Rockwell album, which was the most critically acclaimed album of 2019. Yes, according to Metacritic, it landed the highest on the most lists of any 2019 release when they released their best albums of the year list. Norman Fucking Rockwell by Lana Del Rey was at the top of that. It was also Grammy nominated for Album of the Year in 2020. 
But that album, like Antonov's other album of the year nominee from that year, Lover by T. Swizzle, lost out to Billie Eilish's album, which is probably also why Phineas won Producer of the Year over Jack Antonoff in that same year, last Grammy. But Billie Eilish and Phineas just captured and honed a very dark and unique vibe that was just perfect for the time. But Jack Antonoff produced two nominees there, and Lana's Norman fucking Rockwell might be her best album to date. So I haven't yet told you who I think should win this year, but that should tell you who I thought was the most deserving of the win last year. But yeah, Jack Antonoff's been on fire. This is his second nomination in this category, but his first hit came in 2012 with the band Fun's We Are Young, featuring Janelle Monae. Remember that song being everywhere that year? Well, Antonoff produced that entire album. He produced Sarah Briellis' 2013 hit, Brave. He produced Taylor Swift's 1989 album in 2014. He produced her Reputation album in 2017. He produced Lord's entire Melodrama album in 2017. That's another Album of the Year nominee. But Lord and others lost to Bruno Mars's 24K Magic that year. But Antonov's been killing it, and this past year was no different. Dan Auerbach of the Black Keys is nominated for the third time. He actually won this award once in 2012 for the Black Keys' El Camino album. That's the one with, like, Lonely Boy. It's not my favorite album, but this is the one that had probably their biggest hits. Either that or Brothers just before that, but maybe El Camino. Now, Dan Auerbach not only dropped two solo non-Black Keys albums, but he actually also has his own record label, Easy Eye Records. This is a very rock and roll, blues, blues rock, Americana, and bluesy folk-centric label. Singer-songwriter James Taylor style stuff as well. Easy Eye Records has total throwback vibes, but his label's album artwork is also vintage, and it's, it has a very specific aesthetic. Just look at the different album covers. And Arbach dropped like six or seven projects from his label last year. This is like a blues rock equivalent to Master P and No Limit Records peak. Nah, No Limit seemed like they had an artist dropping an album at least once a month for a long stretch there. But Easy Eye Records is rolling, and I think that this is kind of an interesting nomination for a series of albums without any real hits getting this type of Grammy recognition. I wonder if Dan Arbach knows someone at the Recording Academy. No, seriously, isn't it kind of crazy that someone producing for the likes of Marcus King, Jimmy Duck Holmes, Early James, and John Anderson, y'all might not know any of these people, but them nominated alongside Taylor Swift, Lana Del Rey, and Billie Eilish producers, you know? He did produce an album by CeeLo last year, but it's not like CeeLo's at peak relevance today in terms of album per album attention. He was much bigger in the late 90s to early 2000s to even mid to late 2000s. I absolutely loved his first two albums with The Goody Mob, but I mean, his hit Fuck You, written by Bruno Mars, that was 10 years ago. So how is Dan Arbach nominated for essentially taking his record label and its product very seriously and devoting himself to the works of his label's artists? Almost sounds too good and pure to be true, doesn't it? By the way, check out one of the albums that he was nominated for last year by Yola, an Americana artist from the label. Seriously. In fact, just check out the opening song to her Walk Through Fire album called Far Away Look, then come back and tell me that that isn't pretty phenomenal. Now Dave Cobb is also nominated here for a variety of alt-country works. He's part of this alt-country wave producing for artists like Sturgill Simpson, Jason Isbell, the late John Prime's final work, Chris Stapleton, Brandy Carlisle, Zach Brown Band, Amanda Shires, so many more. Even at the beginning of this year, 2021, Barry Gibb of the Bee Gees dropped an album produced by Dave Cobb. Now this nomination, his first in the producer of the year category, is based on him producing Chris Stapleton's new album Starting Over, Brandy Carlisle and Sam Smith's collab single Party of One. He produced Jason Isbell's new album Reunions. He even mixed Jason Isbell's Live from the Ryman live album. Uh, blues rock band Rival Sons new album Feral Roots he produced that too and that had a song called Do Your Worst which hit number one on the Canadian rock chart 
and on the US mainstream rock chart, which is a biggie since rock singles don't really chart well in today's musical landscape. To hit number one on one of the lesser charts like mainstream rock is about as much as you could ask for for a blues rock-ish band, unless maybe you were the Black Keys several years ago. Rival Sons, by the way, are out of Long Beach, California. That's where I'm at now. And finally, he also produced folk rock band Dawes, their new album, Good Luck With Whatever. Dave Cobb is a busy, busy man. Oh yeah, and he produced the final song from John Prine, the late legendary underground-ish folk singer-songwriter. That song is called I Remember Everything. Dave Cobb produced that. Man, John Prine's passing away in 2020 due to COVID. That, that was a bit of a heartbreaker. By the way, they also appear to be including 2019 album by the alt-country, all-female supergroup, The High Women, at least according to the Grammy website. I don't know, guys. Should a March 2019 release qualify for the 2021 Grammys, which awards 2020 music? This is way outside of that specified September 2019 to August 2020 date range. So why the hell is this listed here, guys? Either way, this is going to help Dave Cobb's case if it is considered. Because that High Women Supergroup project, that was very critically acclaimed. Flying Lotus is nominated here for the first time. And it's about time. This enigmatic hip-hop electronic jazz producer has been delivering quality projects since around 2006 with 1983, then a couple years later with the Los Angeles album or EP. Then a couple years later with his 2010 breakthrough, Cosmogramma. Then the rest is history. His reputation is pretty solidified. You started seeing his name appear higher up on festival lineups. And the more he's dropped, the more avant-garde and experimental his music's become. I remember when I was putting together a L.A. hip-hop compilation in the mid-2000s, I was hitting up different homies for beats or tracks that they wanted to contribute. And I hit up Flying Lotus on MySpace when he was just starting to bubble in the underground. I think that he was still interning or working for Herb Magazine at the time. Well, Lotus and I had a mutual homie, Aspect One, who now goes by Spec One or Spec the Kid on Instagram. This is during the Project Blowed hip hop era in LA. Before Low End Theory, this is when like the Knitting Factory was still popping and putting on dope hip hop shows. But when I hit up Flying Lotus, he was totally down. And he was like, yeah, holler at uh, Aspect since Aspect had a lot of his beats on the hard drive. This was maybe one year before Lotus dropped his 1983 debut in 2006. But Flying Lotus has grown his reputation one beat at a time, one project at a time. And was building a name in the LA hip hop scene even before he became the experimental jazz fusion phenomenon that we've come to know him as. And he has since founded his own record label, Brain Feeder, with artists like Kamazi Washington, Toki Monster, Sam I Am, the late Roz G, and Thundercat. In fact, it's mostly his work on Thundercat's new it is what it is album that has Flying Lotus nominated in this producer of the year category. This Thundercat album was hovering around maybe the 30th most critically acclaimed album of the year. That's still pretty high. And it's nominated in the new Grammy category, Best Progressive R&B Album. I like that category, by the way. Now that it is what it is album, it, it wasn't a chart topper like a Taylor Swift, Lana Del Rey, or Billie Eilish album. It only peaked at number 38 on the charts. But people like Thundercat and Flying Lotus, their music isn't created to be chart toppers unless they're producing for like Kendrick Lamar or someone, which they both have, specifically to pimp a butterfly. These are musicians, musicians, producers, producers. They are more the musical descendants of jazz artists or of abstract hip-hop producers like Mad Lib. Flying Lotus, by the way, is literally the grandnephew of Alice Coltrane, the jazz pianist who was married to John Coltrane, one of the greatest jazz saxophonists and in, in musicians ever. But yeah, artists like Flying Lotus and Thundercat don't make music aimed at super mainstream success or pop consumption. However, I feel like almost anyone can enjoy this Thundercat album. With that said, I don't know if this album alone should have merited a Grammy nomination this year. I do think Lotus had years in the past 
that did deserve producer of the year uh, consideration. He didn't produce nearly as many projects as Dan Arbach or Dave Cobb and didn't have the commercial or critical success of the projects that Jack Antonoff had been working on. But with that said, I do like that the Recording Academy is getting creative and imaginative with some of their nominees this year. Flying Lotus is dope. And finally, we've got Andrew Watt, who also goes by Watt. That's Ozzy Osbourne's new go-to guy. He produced most of Ozzy's new album, Ordinary Man. He produced much of the new Five Seconds of Summer album, a couple tracks from Post Malone's Hollywood Bleeding album, including Take What You Want, featuring Ozzy Osbourne and Travis Scott. He produced Break My Heart from Dua Lipa's Future Nostalgia album, a couple songs from Camila Caballo's Romance album, most of Miley Cyrus's Plastic Hearts album, and more. And this was all within the past year. So he's definitely got a strong breadth of work to deserve the nomination here. He's been getting after it. None of these albums, mind you, were critical smashes, but they did have some commercial success, and Ozzy's Ordinary Man was pretty well received. And Miley Cyrus is Miley Cyrus, even though critically it got killed by a few publications. But overall, that's obviously a pretty strong year for Andrew Watt. So who do I think should win this year? I want to go with Jack Antonoff because he should have won it last year. But if I'm looking at this year in a vacuum, I'm actually going to go with Dave Cobb. Alt country music has been making such a statement in recent years. And Jason Isbell's album and Chris Stapleton's album and Dawes' albums... These were really good. Plus, if they are including the High Women's early 2019 album here, which again, is clearly outside of that date range that was specified by the Grammys, and it shouldn't qualify, then man, Dave Cobb's work is tough to beat. I'm going to go with him. He's another guy, by the way, who should have at least been nominated a couple of times in the past. Now, who do I think will win? I think that they'll actually award this one to Jack Antonoff, in part because he probably should have won it last year, but also because Taylor Swift took such a turn stylistically on these Folklore and Evermore albums, and Antonoff produced several of these songs, or at least co-produced. Big statement year for Taylor Swift. Man, with her label drama and them selling her sixth album discography to her agent turned rival Scooter Braun, that just had her vexed. And now look, less than two years later, she's dropped Lover, Folklore, and Evermore since that. And that's truly hers outside of her big machine record label deal. You go, Taylor. By the way, the band, The National, their guitarist, producer, Aaron Dessner, produced even more of both Folklore and Evermore than Antonov did. So he's actually about as deserving of a nomination here, I would think. But yeah, I feel like this is the year Jack Antonoff finally gets his. But yeah, let me know what you think about this overall Grammys. They've been under all kinds of uh, pressure and hot water over the past year. Lots of controversy, or I'd say past couple years. It's been a rocky road lately for the Grammys. But let me know what you think about this category and its nominees and who you think should win and will win. Leave your comments in the comments, and please, like the video, subscribe to the channel if you love all things music and are as big a music junkie as I am. I'm Woog, thanks for tuning in.